French maker DS delivers what it hopes is its pièce de résistance with this DS9 full executive segment luxury saloon. There isn't any sensibly credible reason why you might choose one over its obvious German premium rivals, but life would be very dull indeed if all the decisions we made were sensibly credible. This car is deliciously different, elegant and replete with a DS dose of savoir-faire. You never know, you might really like it. DS does. If back in the 50s you'd found yourself seeking a luxury car with avant-garde looks and cutting-edge technology, it's likely that an automotive model nameplate with two letters would have been on your radar. DS. Back then, that badge designated a classic luxury Citroen. Today, it's a brand in its own right, whose flagship model is this car, the DS9. In the decades since Flamino Bertoni and André Lefebvre's Citroën DS was launched in 1955, we've had a whole succession of large French luxury cars claiming to have picked up where that groundbreaking Gallic limo left off. Renault's 25 and Safran, Citroën's XM and C6, Peugeot 605 and 607. All ended up shipwrecked on the rocks of badge snobbery, personified by the top German makers that dominate the luxury segment. Brands that to date have effectively repelled all serious challengers. There's never been a contender quite like the DS9 though. Its maker claims this BMW 5 Series and Mercedes E-Class sized full executive sector saloon conveys a perfect blend of heritage, remarkable savoir-faire and cutting edge technology. Its detractors, though, will tell you that this car is little more than a tinseled Peugeot 508 only created because the lengthened version of the EMP2 platform it sits upon had already been developed for the DS7 Crossback SUV. Whatever the truth, we think this car offers something deliciously different in its Teutonically dominated segment, primarily a PHEV and designed to give real credence to the DS brand's aspirations as a proper premium sector nameplate. In the case of this model, despite all the Parisian marketing, those aspirations lie mainly in China, where the DS9 is made and where it can sell uninhibited by history and segment expectations. But is it worth consideration here? Well, you'll need the industry's most comprehensive car review, the Car and Driving Road Test, to find out. A different spirit. That used to be what DS was supposed to stand for. Well, it's certainly a different experience at startup. Reaching the unusual diamond emblazoned start button is something of a stretch, but once you've pressed it, you're rewarded with theatrics from the dashboard's BRM Chronographs analog clock, which pirouettes into place just above. At the same time, diamond shaped graphics spin out to both sides of the instrument screen, and the large center stat monitor lights up. You're ready, but for what? A slice of French savoir-faire is being promised here. A car you could imagine speeding to a moonlit assignation along a tree-lined route nationale. And sure enough, this is a full-sized executive saloon with a very different spirit, but not very different engineering. Here in reality is the plug-in hybrid version of Peugeot's 508, dressed for a cruise along the Champs-Élysées, or maybe for a night at the Paris Opera Garnier. All the engineering that matters here has been carried over from that car, even though a considerably lengthier body sits upon its already stretched EMP2 platform. But that shouldn't necessarily matter if the end chocolatier confection is properly premium and delicately dressed with a frisson of the kind of luxurious comfort at the wheel that distinguished Gaelic limos of the 50s and 60s. It's not, of course, in a DS9. There's not enough that's different under the skin from humbler Stellantis Group models for that. But there are things you might really like. Refinement, aided by the acoustic glass, is class leading, really silent, which is a good start. Ride quality is also brilliantly judged, supple without being wafty. 
And that's in a test car lacking the clever DS active scan suspension, which uses a forward facing camera to prepare the dampers for forthcoming bumps. To complete the DS experience, we'd suggest you find the extra wanted for that. We mentioned plug-in hybrid tech, which is what this car's all-petrol powered model range is primarily based around. From launch, DS did offer an unelectrified PureTech 225 model, but at the time of this test in spring 2022, we were told it wasn't expected to be available for long. Small wonder, given the diminutive 1.6-litre capacity of the engine used by this variant. In the BMW 5 Series or Mercedes E-Class segment this car wants to be considered for, customers expect a larger lump than that. Even in a plug-in hybrid powertrain, usually served in this class by a four-cylinder unit of two litres in capacity. But Stellantis Group PHEV Tech is designed around the needs of smaller models than this. So once again, in its mainstream plug-in form, the DS9 fronts up with the 1.6-litre unit mentioned earlier, a Valvetronic engine originally co-developed with BMW. The mainstream front-driven e tent DS9 model we're driving here pairs it with a 110 horsepower electric motor on its leading axle powered by an 11.9 kilowatt hour battery, the combination delivering a total output of 225 brake horsepower. But PHEV models in this segment are expected to put out at least 250 to 300 horsepower, so we were told at the time of filming that this confection would shortly be replaced by an e tent 250 variant with a larger 15.6 kilowatt hour battery and output, as the badge suggests, boosted to 250 horsepower. We'll quote the performance figures for that, rest to 62 miles an hour in 8.1 seconds and a maximum speed of 149 miles an hour or 84 miles an hour in full electric drive. Which is a useful improvement, but it can't get around the fact that the engine up front is of a size more suited to a compact family hatch, which becomes evident whenever you flex your right foot with any kind of vigour trying to coax the car out of its lounge lizard comfort zone as the little engine rasps in protest. As you'd hope, things pick up a bit quicker if you select the most urgent of the four provided drive modes, inevitably titled Sport, which sees the car combining the power of the electric and petrol motors to offer livelier performance. But most of the time, you'll be leaving it in its usual hybrid and comfort settings, which choose the best mix of electric and petrol propulsion to suit your driving style, whilst optimising efficiency as you slur comfortably through the ratios of the 8-speed EAT8 auto gearbox. This features steering wheel mounted paddle shifters, which you won't want to use much, not only because they don't suit the character of the car, but also because they're nasty to the touch and mounted far too high. Electric is the fourth available drive mode, or at least it will be if the battery is fully charged, in which case a very class competitive battery drive range of up to 38 miles is theoretically possible. As usual, in a PHEV of this kind, think more like 25 miles in the real world, as you'll note if you select the power flow monitor that can show on both dashboard screens. The car always starts in full electric drive and gratifyingly seeks to revert to near silent milk float motion whenever possible. On longer trips, you can conserve its ability to do that by activating the center screen's e-save feature, which allows you to preserve battery charge for urban driving you might have to do later in your journey. Should you and your checkbook be fully signed up for enjoyment of the whole DS9 experience to the max, you might want to consider the more powerful top flight PHEV powertrain on offer here, found in the flagship e 4x4 360 models. These are produced by the brand's DS Performance division, already a serious motorsport player following its domination of Formula E. Front-driven E10 DS9 models from the Chinese production line get sent to DS's Formula E base for conversion to 4x4 360 spec, which means the installation of new axles and the addition of an extra motor on the rear one, creating an all-wheel drive powertrain and a more powerful one. 
that extra motor, along with an upgrade in tuning for the 1.6 litre engine to 200 horsepower, delivers an output boosted to 355 horsepower. This lowers the rest to 62 mile an hour time to just 5.6 seconds, en route to a top speed of 155 miles an hour, but driving range is unaffected. The E10's 4x4 360 also gets a handling upgrade with uniquely calibrated springs, dampers and roll bars, a beefier brake setup with four piston calipers clamping 380mm ventilated front discs, a track widened by 24mm at the front and 12mm at the rear, grippy Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tyres and a lower ride height dropped by 15mm at the front and 5mm at the rear. DS tells us firmly that the object here is to produce a potent Grand Tourer rather than a conventional sports saloon, but you can't help feeling that the overall 4x4 360 confection is akin to an opera singer dressed in a pair of springy trainers. This isn't really that kind of car. As you discover in this front-driven plug-in hybrid variant, should you find yourself running late for the conservatoire and attempt to push it along a few twisting secondaries. The car feels long, though that unusual bonnet stripe helps you place it. Steering feedback is languid, even in sport, and the brake pedal feel is initially a touch marshmallowy, which we'll charitably credit as a tribute to the innovative hydraulic brakes of the original DS. But body roll is progressive, less pitchy than we'd expected, and the front end is actually quite responsive when you throw the car into a turn at speed. Shifted out of its genteel comfort zone in this way, sharper bumps can catch out the car's passive suspension. All the more reason to upgrade to that occasionally inconsistent DS active scan setup we mentioned earlier. And your battery drive will be quickly used up, at which point the little engine up front cuts in with a not especially subtle rasp. Better to throttle back and enjoy the kind of relaxed conveyance this DS9 would prefer to be, at which point it genuinely flows along the tarmac in proper Gaelic style, taking tarmac tears and undulations in its stride. The highway's a comfort zone too, of course, particularly if you've chosen a top spec model fitted with the DS Drive Assist package, which uses multiple sensors to automatically control steering trajectory, throttle use, and lane positioning. There's even optional DS night vision for those after dark assignations. You might as well go the whole hog in enjoying this car. DS certainly did. The letters DS came originally from the French word DS or goddess, a fitting description for the iconic 1955 Citroen model this mark derives itself from. The DS9 won't be fondly remembered in quite the same way because there's nothing in its design that will stop you in the street or be considered particularly groundbreaking. But it's different, bejeweled with delicious detailing and undeniably elegant. Particularly in profile, where taut lines run from the headlights to the tail lamps above the flush-fitting door handles, emphasising the fact that this swept-back saloon is longer than it first appears, 4.93 metres in length. There's a two-tone black roof and, of course, big wheels, either 19 or 20 inches in size. As for the detailing, well, look at these little lights on the outside edges of the roof inspired by the cone-shaped upper lamps of that original 50s DS. The real theatre, though, is here at the front, where the parametric grille with its outer chromed DS wings adopts a three-dimensional diamond effect and is flanked by LED headlamps with geocharge light housing seemingly fashioned from scaly lizard skin. The pièce de résistance is this Clou de Paris sabre, a chromed central bonnet embellisher that you'll either find elegant or pretentious, depending on your style perspective. There's just as much going on at the rear. The chiselled lights resume the three-dimensional scaly theme and are underlined by lateral chrome sabres, supposed to reference great French coach builders of the 1930s. Slim, squarical exhaust tips peep subtly out of a low-key diffuser, while an elegantly thin third brake light emphasises this Galax sedan's 1.85-metre width, 
Is all of this just a smokescreen to hide the fact that the EMP2 chassis underpinnings of a much humbler Peugeot 508 lie beneath all this tinsel? You decide. Don't make up your mind on all of this quite yet, though, because you haven't seen the cabin. As you approach the car, the DS Active LED Vision headlamps will perform a little light show, their little individual beam units pirouetting in the headlamp pods. And if you've the rather disappointingly cheap feeling key in your pocket, the car will sense its presence once you're within one and a half metres of the vehicle and greet you by deploying its door handles as it unlocks itself automatically. Connect with the right DS app and you can also gain access via your smartphone, even if your handset has no network signal. It would be nice if the door could open by itself. We're starting to see that in models only slightly pricier than this, like the Mercedes EQE. As it is, you tug on this stylized but rather cheap feeling handle. Here in the front of the cabin is where DS delivers its boldest flourishes. If you like Teutonic simplicity and clarity of form, look away now. What's served up here is a glorious antidote to all that, a celebration, the designers hope, of everything that's cutting edge in French fashion. Gaelic car designers of the 20s and 30s famously specialised in creating interiors that didn't really feel very automotive at all. This is one of those intentionally quirky, sumptuously stitched and elaborately speckled with angular switches and dials, conforming to this brand all-encompassing diamond design theme. It's hard to know what to look at first. Curiously beveled buttons parade down either side of the phallically fashioned gear stick. The centre vents that surround the unconventionally square starter button have pearled accents. Double stitch Alcantara panels flow from either door across a fascia bookended at either corner by strangely shaped vertical vents. And an haute couture analog clock from BRM, French chronographers, Bernard Richards manufacturer, Pirouettes out of the top of the dash at start-up. Elegantly knurled roller buttons feature for screen volume and steering spoke features. And there's an elaborately stitched flat-bottomed four-spoke steering wheel with a leather centre bezel that feels very 50s. The question is, though, whether this is all a real expression of class or merely a pastiche of yesteryear Gallic automotive culture. There's certainly enough to make you wonder whether you're being asked to play along with a pleasantly diverting pretense here. Is this really premium? Cheaply fashioned door catches, nastily finished, overly high set plastic steering wheel paddles, Citroen parts bin column stalks and feeble rear view camera resolution suggest not. Ergonomic excellence has been sacrificed at the altar of fashion too. The start button is a ridiculous reach away. The left-hand side area behind the steering wheel is cluttered with three different controls. And that wheel hides the door mirror adjustment and cruise control buttons. And the strange juillage patterning of the lower console switch rows make it difficult to identify which button does what unless you take your eye off the road for far too long to investigate. Perhaps more significantly, there certainly isn't the sturdiness of build and the proper cool metal finishing you get from a German-branded premium rival. But of course, you'd be choosing this car in search of something different from all that. The 12.3-inch digital instrument cluster screen you view through that thick rimmed wheel is certainly different. Six different display modes, personal, minimum, energy, dials, driving and navigation, accessed via a roller switch on the left-hand side of the steering wheel, prompt intricately animated changes from the state-of-the-art animation. Dials and personal prioritise a digital speedo in the centre of the screen with flanking information sections. Navigation centres on GPS mapping. Energy emphasises an energy flow monitor. And if all that gives you a headache, minimum pairs all the info down to the absolute basics. Optionally, you can add in an infrared night vision display. Everything else you'll need to know resides on this 12-inch HD centre touch-sensitive display, which doesn't appear to have any sort of home screen and unfortunately has been burdened with all the climate control functions, which often means an annoying need to constantly switch back and forth between menu screens. The designers have attempted to compensate for that with the row of shortcut climate buttons that sit to the left of the centred volume roller switch at the base of the monitor. To the right of that switch 
are buttons connecting you into the screen's music, navigation, phone and car features. Functionality is basically fine, but the system's reactions could be quicker, its resolution sharper, and the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto phone mirroring system isn't wireless. All might be forgiven, though, if you've built into this display the available Focal Electra Hi-Fi audio system upgrade we have here, which gives you 515 watts of amplifier power, an 8-inch subwoofer and 14 speakers, two of which are framed by these lovely silver grills on the A-pillars. The seats are good too, plumply upholstered either in Alcantara and leather-style vinyl, as here, or further up the range there's full leather, or you can stretch to the brand's signature watch strap design Napa leather package, which really is high-end. As for forward visibility, while well, that Clou de Paris bonnet sabre strip we mentioned earlier plays a useful role here, a guide in how much of the car lies ahead of you when slotting into tight spaces. Over-the-shoulder visibility is compromised by the thick rear pillars, so you're going to need the standard rear sensors, rear camera and blind spot monitoring system. On to practicalities like cabin storage. Fashionable fripperies are all very well, but before fussing about with trendy timepieces, we'd have preferred that the DS designers might have spent time concentrating on finding a way of engineering right-hand drive models so that the majority of space in the glove box wasn't taken up with a fuse box, which has once again happened here. To be fair, that's compensated for by a lot of stowage space elsewhere, most of it in this simply enormous stowage box between the seats with its neat stitched butterfly opening double lid and illuminated interior. In front of this lie two large cup holders, plus there's a further stowage area at the base of the centre stack with an elegant Alcantara covered lid, beneath which reside two USB-A ports, a 12 volt socket and an optional phone charging mat. DS has forgotten an overhead compartment for your sunglasses, but you get lovely touch-sensitive diamond-buttoned overhead lights, ticket clips in the sun visors and spacious door bins that are lined so that keys and smaller items won't rattle about. Right, let's take a look in the rear. Now, you'd hope for quite a lot here. This DS9 might share its lengthier EMP2 platform with a mid-sized Peugeot 508, but it's a significant 184 millimetres longer than that car. The resultant 4,934 millimetres length, almost exactly replicating that of full-sized executive segment models like the Mercedes E-Class and the Audi A6. These long back doors certainly suggest limo levels of rear seat legroom. But that isn't really delivered once you get inside. It really doesn't feel any more spacious than a Passat-sized medium model like that Peugeot 508 back here. This impression isn't helped by the swept-back roofline, which means headroom isn't especially generous, particularly if you've opted for the optional sunroof. Nor does it help that there's not much space to slide your feet beneath the seat in front. At least the transmission tunnel's relatively low, so a third centrally positioned adult could be squeezed in at a pinch, but it would be a pinch because the cabin feels rather narrow. Still, enjoy the luxury. Even on this base model, you're surrounded by stitched Alcantara, which extends not only into the doors, but also across the rear parcel shelf. If you've gone for the Focal Electra Hi-Fi upgrade, that'll be liberally adorned with various speakers. Overall, as at the front, it all feels very nice indeed. You'd hope in this segment and at this price to get a three-zone climate system with separate rear control buttons back here, something that's standard on just about every Golf these days. That costs extra here, as does the feature that would really make this back seat feel limo-like and opulent, the rear lounge armrest package, which adds in extra controls to the interior of this beautifully stitched central armrest that heat, ventilate and massage the upholstery. Without that extra cost pack, the armrest centre gets this rather vacant blank section ahead of a nicely lined cubby. The end of the armrest has pop-out cup holders, and as you'd want in the rear for a car of this price, there are twin vents and twin USB ports of the USB-A type. You also get netted seat back pockets and coat hooks in the grab handles. 
Let's finish with a look at the boot. Now, here at last, the dimensions of this car actually deliver in terms of space. In fact, it's got by far the largest boot capacity of any plug-in model in the full executive segment, 510 litres, which, if you're interested, is 23 litres more than the 508 model this car's based upon. In competing segment terms, the BMW 530e has 410 litres, a Mercedes E300e has 370 litres, and an Audi A650 TFSI-e just 360 litres. Bravo DS! But hasn't the brand here got its priorities rather the wrong way round? Isn't a car like this supposed to reward the French executive reclining in the rear, perusing Paris Match along the Champs-Élysées? rather than aiding his chauffeur loading the Louis Vuitton luggage into the back. There are some nice touches too, a couple of useful anchor-shaped pull-down hooks from the boot roof, and the fact that the lid to the lower compartment stays up when you raise it, revealing space for the unfortunately optional spare wheel, but not enough room, irritatingly, for the second three-pin domestic plug charging lead you'll want to have. This has to take up boot space above in this large bag. There's a netted area to the left and four silver tie downs to keep heavy luggage in place. If it is heavy, you may well have inadvertently scraped it across this rather prominent black plastic lip on the way in. There are some irritations. Elasticated straps are provided along each cargo sidewall, but they're too far away to easily reach and the boot in a roof is just painted metal, which isn't very premium. If you specified the focal hi-fi upgrade, that inner roof is where you'll find the subwoofer. Oh, and by the way, if you have this fitted, or the electric boot lid or the back seat rear lounge armrest package, boot space does fall to 473 litres. DS includes a rear ski hatch and the rear bench split fold 6040 for those days when you simply can't resist the allure of flat pack furniture. It's estimated that this DS9 will account for just 0.02% of UK new car sales. So, if you want rarity, you've got it right here. You'll be almost guaranteed that no one else in your office car park will have one, and customers are only offered this saloon body style. There's no estate available. Still interested? Well, if so, you'll next need to know that the brand hasn't been shy with its pricing, evidenced by the fact that at the time of this test in spring 2022, the version likely to account for most UK sales, this Performance Line Plus e 225 plug-in variant, cost just over £46,000. This car's PHEV engine and 11.9 kilowatt hour battery combination, we were told at the time of filming, would shortly be replaced by an upgraded E-Tense 250 plug-in powertrain with a larger 15.6 kilowatt hour battery. Performance Line Plus is the more affordable of the two spec levels being offered. For £3,100 more, you can stretch to top Rivoli Plus trim. The all-petrol engine range is straightforward too, or at least in time it will be. At the time of this test, DS was offering an unelectrified entry-level PureTech 225 model, costing from just over £40,000 in performance line plus trim. But industry sources were telling us that the conventional version of the 1.6-litre turbo engine wouldn't be offered for very long. So it's best to think of the DS9 range as being a PHEV-only lineup. The starting point from launch was this e 225 model, but as we just told you, going forward, this will get replaced by an e 250 variant, which shouldn't differ too much from the price we gave you earlier. Got that? Good. If you've more to spend, £8,000 more gets you the flagship e 4x4 360 model which adds an extra rear-mounted electric motor to the same plug-in powertrain, boosting power and delivering all-wheel drive traction. But with top-spec trim, that's priced up at over £57,000, or maybe just over £60,000 with some key extras fitted, which really is right up in exalted premium territory. You'd really need to be fully signed up to this car's Parisian vibe to pay that. You might find it a bit of a trek to find your nearest DS retailer, depending on where in the country you happen to live, of course. At the time of filming, 
There were only 28 UK dealerships, though more are planned. At least the mark isn't just inhabiting a differently carpeted part of a Citroen showroom, as was basically the case when it first started out. And the company is talking about class-leading customer service, though it's not quite up to what you get from, say, a comparable Genesis. Still, it's pretty close to that benchmark standard. Customers can elect to get their DS collected from home or office for servicing. They can rent cars from dealers in various ways should a different kind of model be needed. And they can attend privileged events, things like Kew Gardens trips or Harvey Nichols shop-ins, baking schools and so on. They're also granted special access to British Formula E races. DS won the 2020 and 2021 Formula E championships. All of this explains why the brand is growing faster than you might think. Its sales execs claimed that it outsold Lexus in Europe in 2021. When it comes to the value proposition on offer here, the proposition is complicated. So we'll try and guide you through it as clearly as we can. We'll start by saying that we can't ignore the fact, and nor should you if you're considering one of these, that this car shares nearly all its engineering with a humbler Peugeot 508. Yes, that 508 is 184 millimetres shorter and has a slightly smaller boot, but it's difficult to ignore the price difference between that car and a DS9. As we've said, the base DS9 E10 225 Performance Line Plus plug-in model we have here costs just over £46,000 at launch. All the same engineering in a Peugeot 508 Hybrid 4 would, at the time of this test, have cost you just over £37,000. With that car in its base Allure Premium level of trim. Even if you were to get a 508 Hybrid 4 with top spec GT Premium spec, you'd still only be paying just over £40,000. If you're comparing with the fastest possible DS9, the picture's a little different. Interestingly, the top Peugeot 508, the Peugeot Sport engineered hybrid 4360 version, cost around £54,000 at the time of this test. So, wouldn't save you anything at all over an identically engineered DS9 E Tense 4x4 360 model. The DS brand, of course, would prefer that you didn't engage in comparisons of that sort. This car has been intentionally sized, not only above a 508, but also above BMW 3 Series sized compact sports saloons. Sure enough, its 4,934mm length is very similar to rival full executive sector market leaders, represented in plug-in petrol form by the Mercedes E300e and the Audi A650 TFSIe. Though this DS is 29mm shorter than the other main full executive segment contender, the BMW 530e. What about pricing comparisons with those three cars? Well, at first glance, the £46,000 sticker figure of the DS9 E10 225 Performance Line Plus model we have here looks very good value against the three Teutonic models just mentioned. They start at around £50,000 in the case of the BMW and the Mercedes, or around £54,000 in the case of the Audi. And you'd need to add three to four thousand pounds to all of those figures to replicate what even this DS9's base performance line plus level of spec can deliver. The problem with that comparison, though, is that this base DS9 plug-in model's 225 horsepower engine output looks a little weedy in this company. A 530e gives you 252 horsepower, an A650 TFSIE has 300, and an E300e is up at 333. So, to match the performance of those three German models, you'd really need the DS9 in top e 10s 4x4 360 form at around £54,000, in which case you'd be back to square one, paying much the same money as would be required for the BMW, the Mercedes and the Audi. Though, that top DS9 would give you the added benefit of four-wheel drive. Most customers for this Gallic limo will be restricting their attention to this mainstream e 10 225 plug-in model. And if you can live without that bit of extra performance, as we've said, the price looks good against comparably equipped full executive sector BMW, Mercedes and Audi PHEV saloon rivals. In fact, you'd be paying much the same money as you'd have to find for comparably equipped versions of much smaller premium branded PHEV models in the segment below. Cars like BMW 330e and the Mercedes C300e. 
the C300e, in fact, is actually pricier than this DS9 even before you start trying to load it up with a comparable level of equipment. It's all food for thought, and the reasoning we've just gone through would allow you to make quite a strong value case for this DS if you were funding through outright purchase. The problem for this French brand, though, is that most of the customers in this business-orientated segment don't do that. Acquiring their cars instead on finance deals, the monthly payments for which are heavily dependent on the kind of buoyant end-of-term residual values that this DS9 just can't offer. As a result, on a typical three-year PCP finance deal, your monthly payments on a DS9 are going to be considerably higher than they would be for a more powerful 530e, e300e or a6 tfsie. And a top spec DS9 could cost you nearly double in monthly payments over what you'd have to find for the equivalent Peugeot 508 PHEV model we mentioned earlier. It would also cost you more than other potential choices you might conceivably make. Plush plug-in versions of the Volvo S60, the Volkswagen Arteon and the Skoda Superb, for instance. Maybe also the plug-in version of this model's identically engineered French Stellantis Group cousin, the Citroën C5X, which some might argue more accurately delivers a modern-day version of that old 50s DS model. It's important that you should know all this and know what you're getting into with this car before you go any further. If nothing so far has put you off and you're still with us, then congratulations. You really are an individual and you deserve to enjoy the very unique and well-equipped experience this car has to offer. Just how well-equipped is it? Well, let's take a look at that now. Starting with the features common across all DS9 variants. The DS Active LED Vision headlamps with beams that pirouette to greet you as you approach are standard fit. And so are the active flush fitting door handles which work with a keyless entry and start system. You also get all round parking sensors, 3D LED rear lights, power folding mirrors, auto headlamps and wipers, automatic welcome lighting, scrolling indicators, a perimetric alarm and for the headlamps, high beam assist and a dynamic bending light function. Plus a full portfolio of camera safety features which we'll get to in a few minutes. Inside all DS9s, there's a 12.3-inch virtual instrument cluster, along with ambient lighting, powered and heated front seats with memory settings, aluminium sports pedals, a rear-view camera, bi-zone automatic air conditioning, cruise control with a speed limiter, steering wheel paddle shifters, split-folding rear seats with a ski hatch, and the unique perambulating BRM R180 analogue dashboard clock created by French horologists BRM. Media features are taken care of by a 12-inch centre dash HD infotainment touchscreen that incorporates voice recognition, an eight-speaker DAB audio system, Bluetooth, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone integration and 3D connected DS Connect navigation. All DS9 owners also get access to the My DS app. Now, with this, you can schedule charging times, precondition the cabin climate, and see your car's current state of charge and approximate remaining range. Right, that's the common equipment items covered. On to features specific to trim level. Now, this performance line plus spec is identifiable by its 19-inch Monaco design alloy wheels, which are upgraded to 20-inch Munich design rims on the faster e 10 4x4 360 version. And inside, with Performance Line Plus spec, you get black Alcantara seats, part trimmed in leather effect vinyl, with smart black Alcantara cabin decor. And a perforated leather steering wheel with dual colour stitching. The plusher Rivoli Plus trim level is identifiable by its Versailles design 19-inch wheels, unless you've chosen the e 10 4x4 360 version, which once again features the 20-inch Munich design rims. 
Inside a Rivoli Plus DS9, the upholstery switches to basalt black full leather with diamond-shaped finishing and diamond-shaped leather interior decor. Plus, the seats gain ventilation and massaging functions. The reverse camera is of the wider-ranging 360-degree vision sort. There's an air quality system and you get a phone charging mat. There's also a more superior polyambient lighting system in the door panels, variable through eight colours. You have to stretch to a Rivoli Plus model to get the DS Active Scan system fitted as standard, which scans the road ahead as you drive, looking for bumps, then preconditioning the dampers to absorb them. At Rivoli Plus level, various DS Drive Assist features are added too, which we'll brief you on shortly. Another incentive to stretch up to Rivoli Plus trim is that it's only with this level of spec that you can spend £3,000 more to specify the Opera interior pack, something we think you're really going to want on this car. This gives you the brand's signature watch strap, leather quilted upholstery finishing with softer Nappa leather in either basalt black or rubis red. Very nice. And it comes with pearl stitching and an opulent black Alcantara headliner. Plus, the Opera interior pack also includes a sunroof and a package for the rear seat, a rear lounge armrest, and upholstery that's heated, ventilated, and includes a massaging function. If you're a DS9 Rivoli Plus customer and don't want the full Opera interior pack, you can get all the rear seat features just mentioned for £2,000 with an optional Rivoli lounge pack. The sunroof can be specified separately, if you wish, right across the range for an extra £1,300. A key item you'd ideally want to pay extra for on any DS9 is the upgraded Focal Electra Hi-Fi system we've been trying here, which requires just under £1,000 more from you. It includes a 515-watt amplifier, 14 speakers and an 8-inch subwoofer. You might also want to consider the extended Bi-Zone automatic air conditioning package, which gives you extra rear seat climate controls. Other extra spend features include an electric tailgate, a spare wheel, a Type 2 accelerated charging cable, the DS night vision system for infrared 360 degree forward screen view after dark, and the DS park pilot setup that will automatically steer the car into spaces for you. With this Performance Line Plus level of trim, you can pay £1,000 more to add the DS Active Scan suspension system. And with this base trim level, you can also add a wireless charging mat for your phone and a textured black finish for the DS wings around the front grille. Bear in mind before you spend too much on any of this stuff that you're almost certainly going to have to pay your DS dealer more for your choice of paint colour. The only standard shade is metallic midnight blue. Beyond that, there are various metallic colours, including this test cars, Artense Grey, all of which cost £625 more. The single pearl white pearlescent colour costs £825 more. On to safety. Now, you'll want first to know about the camera-driven stuff, and there's nothing here we haven't seen before. All versions of this DS get autonomous braking, an active safety brake system that detects hazards ahead and will apply the brakes if the driver doesn't react. You can set its level of responsiveness too. Choose from close, normal or far. There's also a lane-keeping assist system that will alert you if you drift out of lane on the highway and ease you back to where you ought to be, and a traffic signs recognition feature that will picture road signs as you pass and display them on the dash. This works with a speed recommendation system that can automatically set your speed to the prevailing limit Plus, there's an active blind spot monitoring setup that will alert you if you're about to dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle. On top of this, there's driver attention warning, a timed system that will warn you if the electronics sense from your reactions that you're getting drowsy at the wheel. Earlier, we mentioned the automatic headlamp dipping system too. And as you'd expect, there are all the usual things like twin front side and curtain airbags, plus rear curtain airbags too. If any of these ever inflate, the car's DS Connect box package will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact location. 
Isofix child seat fastenings, of course, also feature, along with hill start assist and the usual electronic assistance for braking, stability and traction control. We mentioned earlier that with the top Rivoli Plus trim level, you additionally get the brand's DS Drive Assist package for level two semi-autonomous driving. Usable at up to 111 miles an hour, this uses multiple sensors to position the DS9 precisely in its lane using a lane positioning assist system. The DS Drive Assist package then employs adaptive cruise control for use not only on the highway, but in stop-start urban traffic jams. You can take back control at any time by merely moving the steering wheel or activating the indicators. All this car's full executive segment plug-in rivals use larger capacity petrol engines than the 1.6-litre unit featuring in this DS9. With that in mind, it would be a disappointment if this car's efficiency figures weren't class competitive, as, by and large, they are. The key figure with any PHEV is the CO2 reading, because that, of course, is what your benefiting kind tax is going to be based upon. The DS9 E10 225 we're trying here manages a 35 gram per kilometer figure. It's a best of 41 grams per kilometer for the faster E10 4x4 360 model, which means a BIK tax rate of 11% or 13% for the faster variant. That'll drop, DS promises us, to 26 grams per kilometer with the E10 250 model, which is about to replace the car we're driving here equipped with a battery raised in size from 11.9 to 15.6 kilowatt hours. To give you some class perspective here, a Mercedes E300e records a 35 gram per kilometer reading, a BMW 530e is rated at 31 grams a kilometer, and the Audi A650 TFSIE delivers a 27 gram per kilometer figure. For fuel saving, the all-electric driving range figure is equally important, rated at up to 38 miles for all DS9 PHEV variants. For class perspective, that's better than an E300e at 35 miles, about the same as a 530e, and a bit less than an A650 TFSIE at 43 miles. That Audi, curiously, records exactly the same top combined cycle fuel figure as all DS9 plugins, 256.8 mpg. The 530e only just about crests the 200 mpg mark, while the E300e is down at 188.3 mpg. Not that these three-figure fuel readings mean anything, of course. You'll never achieve anything close to them, and we can't imagine how the WLTP cycle testers ever did. Real-time readings will probably be somewhere close to those of a conventional unelectrified diesel. But the important thing is that the government believes the all-round efficiency stats, hence the applicable low BIK tax rate, which at the time of this test on this E10 225 model was just £169 a month for a 40% taxpayer, or £84 a month in the unlikely event you happen to be rated at 20%. The fuel returns you actually achieve in your DS9 will of course be heavily dependent on the way you drive it and how often you engage the most frugal hybrid and electric drive settings. DS provides a proactive in-car tool for monitoring of drive efficiency, the DS Energy Coach app, though annoyingly it's limited to the top 4x4 360 variant. This app gives you a readout of your brake regeneration and a score of how well you're doing. On any DS9, you can be sure you're maximising that energy recuperation process by pushing the gear lever into its regenerative B mode. This slows the vehicle more heavily off throttle while harnessing kinetic energy generated back into the battery, thus enhancing range by up to 20% in urban driving. In exclusive town travel, DS reckons the battery could actually take you up to 43 miles. Well, good luck with that. To save charge for the city, the centre screen's electric section contains an e-save menu allowing you to save full battery capacity or either 6 or 12 miles of it for when your journey will need it most. 
the electric section also has statistics with graphical mile per kilowatt hour and MPG readouts, a power flow monitor and a charge section which allows you to preset charging times and pre-climate the cabin before departure if you don't want to do it on the provided MyDS app. When the car's connected to a typical garage wall box, its 7.4 kilowatt onboard charger allows a 0 to 100% charge to be completed in two hours and 23 minutes, better than the four and a half hour period that would be required from a domestic socket. A public rapid charger improves that time to around an hour and 45 minutes. DS partners with Podpoint to install wall boxes in customers' houses. At the time of this test, with the aid of an available government grant, the cost of that was £359, including VAT. The company gives access to over 20,000 public charge points around the UK. Of course, running costs are about a lot more than just fuel economy, CO2 readings and driving range. So what else are you going to need to know? Well, there's the usual unremarkable three-year or 60,000 mile warranty. The PHEV battery has its own standalone eight-year, 100,000 mile warranty. Service intervals are every year or every 20,000 miles with normal usage or every year or 12,500 miles if the car's regularly driven in arduous conditions. DS doesn't offer any fixed cost service or maintenance plan that would allow you to budget ahead for garage costs and residual values are also going to be key to whole life running costs. These are difficult to accurately predict for a new product from a relatively new brand but initial signs for the industry are encouraging here and this car's comparative rarity will certainly help. And you'll be looked after well by the brand's small band of UK dealers who run an Only You programme for customers. This gives a DS9 owner or lease driver direct access to a single contact to help with servicing and roadside assistance, along with anything else a conventional dealer might usually provide. Now finally, let's give you an idea of what you'll be looking at when it comes to insurance groupings. The E10 225 variant we're trying here is rated at Group 39E with both trim levels. DS expects that to rise to Group 41E when this derivative is replaced by the bigger battery E10 250 model. The top E10 4x4 360 version is rated at Group 43E with both trim levels. Those prepared to invest in a DS9 will, like the car itself, be fairly unconventional. In that respect, at least, it's accurately reflective of its Citroen DS50's predecessor. Unlike that car, this one isn't really groundbreaking. But if it succeeds in making headway in its German brand dominated segment, it certainly would be. That isn't going to happen, but there are still reasons why the right kind of customer might really like what's on offer here. Refinement is class leading, equipment levels are generous and there's a special feel to the overall design inside and out that you might not get in a car twice as expensive as this one. Yes, it's easy to be cynical about a contender that claims to be unique but borrow so much from volume brand engineering but then you could say that to some extent of just about any executive contender these days. The DS9 does at least clothe its familiar mechanicals with an assured slice of Gallic flair. It doesn't match its key German rivals in terms of drive dynamics and it also trails them in terms of build quality and running cost efficiency. In compensation though, it offers a far greater sense of uniqueness and luxury. For many, that won't be enough, but for the discerning few prepared to invest in what DS calls a different spirit, a new form of badge equity, this DS9 will offer a refreshing change from the executive norm.